بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا أبي المرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد. So continuing in our discussion on the logical proofs of the conditions of a Sahih Hadith or a sound Hadith, we had spoken about two already. What were the first two? Precision. Okay. Good. And. Ah, and trustworthiness. So these are trustworthiness, adala, and. Precision, dhabt. Uh, what is, how do you gauge somebody's trustworthiness? Community. Okay, by, by asking about him. What else? Um, outward religious acts. Huh, outward religious acts. And why was it, so the community is a good, wage, a good gauge of him outwardly. Like, why is it important to see his, how religious he is or how he practices? Right, so if he apparently fears Allah, we would hope that that internal, that is a reflection of his internal gauge. Mm -hmm. So now you have both these external gauges from the community and you have this internal gauge that you hope this person has that will prevent him from what? What are the two things? Every time we have a piece of information, every time we have a khabar or a statement or an action, what are the, what are the two things that I'm trying to prove or what are the two things that I'm trying to avoid when I establish that? Hmm. Two There's two things I'm trying to avoid every time I deal with a statement or an action or a piece of news. Yeah. So, so, okay, that it's that it's not false. And we said that there are two main reasons that a piece of information or news is usually false. What are those two reasons? Mistake. Right. It could either be a mistake or. Okay. On purpose is what? An on purpose mistake is called what? A lie. <laughs> <laughs> so, like <laughs> some So, if if I'm trying to verify a piece of information, there are two things that I'm trying to avoid in that verification. One of them is that there is no lies that are in it, and that the person is not hmm, has not made a made a mistake. And we said in order to help us verify that there is not a mistake and that this is a truthful piece of information, there are conditions to this. The first two conditions we had spoken about, which are the trustworthiness and precision. and precision. Um, the trustworthiness we spoke about and why that's important because this is a better gauge of what from the two from lying or mistakes Which is this a better, better gauge of to avoid to help me avoid? Yeah. Huh the lying right so if I know that this person is trustworthy, there's a bet there's a less chance of him Lying, lying right or in in absence of lying they in the precision is important because that's more of a focus on what? Accuracy. On accuracy, which is from the two parts. What am I trying to avoid and minimize? Mistakes and errors. So these two things will, these are the two, first two conditions that we had put forward concerning the narrators. Now, the next part of this is the ittisal or the connected chain. Now, connected chain is, is something that is very unique to the Muslims, is very unique to Islam. Uh, this is not something that you find in other religions. You don't find this even amongst historians. How do historians write history? So if I'm a historian, right, and I want to write about the United States in 1981, what would I do? Okay, I would research. Research is a very broad term. And I, I, don't, think, I don't think it's wrong. Okay, I can talk to people who lived during that era, for sure. What else? All right, I have to evaluate those sources. And I, can det I have to determine what are primary resources. So what would be considered for you guys a primary resource? So in, in this day and age, was it, would a newspaper work? No. So if, like, if I wanted to find out about like the year 1981, what was going on, yeah. Yeah. where would I look? Yeah. Huh? Okay, scholarly articles, okay, that's fine. And news, news, you guys are okay with news, newspapers or no? Yeah. Are, are, well, like everybody's like kind of talking, everyone's kind of like talking at once, so I'm like, all I'm hearing is <laughs> Yeah, huh? Yeah. You, you think it's okay? They, all right, here, let me ask this question. Who has a problem with newspapers? You do? Okay. And I'm, I'm assuming everyone else is okay with it? All right, why do, what is your problem with newspapers? Huh? Who owns it? Okay, so you, you definitely do have owners to the newspapers, but does the ownership... Oh, uh, you, you, have, you can have you know, these really ill-intent individuals who own these corporations, who own these businesses, but does that make the people who work for them bad? No, right? So Jeff Bezos, he's the owner of Amazon today. Like, does that make that person who's working in the factory a bad person? Yes, it does, no. according to Fazi. No, okay. So 
it, it doesn't make that individual bad. So the same thing would apply to news. But what does that, if I know who owns it, how does that help me as a reader? I'm talking about a newspaper, a news outlet, anything, right? There's, there's different ways we consume media today. Like, what is a way we consume media today and get news today that we didn't have access to in the 80s? YouTube, news what, what do we call all that? We call that social media, right? We call it social media. But even in social media, we have tears in that too. So the question now comes with, with the news, because you did mention an important point. If I know the owner of a particular newspaper or a particular news outlet, how does that help me as the researcher? Okay, what, what, what do you, I, I want something a little bit simpler. What will that gauge me, like help me gauge? The company's values. Okay, so. The, with yours. Okay, yeah. so, the, and, well, and what do we call that? There's a term for it. Work ethics. You, you guys are getting close. You're like kind of like, you're around it. Mm, close. Bias. No. Right? So if, if, if I know the attitude of an owner of a particular organization, uh, like Rupert Murdoch. You guys know who he is? No? Mm -hmm. Man, you guys need to step up your, in your news game a little bit. Who is, please inform us, who's Rupert Murdoch? He's, he's not just an investor. He owns a lot of the major news corporations <laughs> in the U.S. today. Um, and it, why is it important to understand the owner? Because that owner, is there a certain type of news that he's going to want to push out? Yes. Right there's a certain right there's a certain narrative that they try to push and, and and if I understand what the bias is from both of these I can take the negative and I can take the positive and then what can I do with it I, I can I can tr try to reconcile and I can come out with like what is actually the news here so um, a, a very modern example you guys know um, I don't know if those of you have heard that the 50 migrants that were shipped to or you know to Martha's Vineyard they, how are the different news outlets portraying this some of them are saying it's what? Good. It's good. And some of them are saying it's bad. For those that are saying it's bad, why are they saying it's bad? Are they using uh, people as... Uh, they're, us they're, us uh, they're, right, they're using people as political tools. Right? They're using individuals as political tools, and they're moving them to the space because they're trying to make a political statement, but they don't really care about the people. Type. And the people who are saying this is good, why are they saying it's good? Right, so because this, will, they're saying, the argument is that this will help create awareness. You're saying that, okay, they're being used as a political tool, but they are being used as a political tool currently in our state. We want to bring this awareness to states that don't have to face and deal with this issue. So do you understand like, how you can have a bias from the same piece of news and the same piece of information, but what is the one thing that we can agree upon, whether we see it to be good or bad? What happened? What is my takeaway? That migrants... Well, migrants are suffering, right? Or that, that's one way of looking at it. What's another thing I could take away from? Like a, a more factual statement. Huh? That people are being moved from one place to another, right? This, is, this can be my factual information that I can take away from that, regardless of how I feel about, about the issue. And if I know the bias of these things, not just is, is bias, but there's another layer of things when I look at newspapers. Is every newspaper as trustworthy as the next? No. No. I, that's where I have to make my own judgment call, and I have to figure out, okay, which newspapers can I trust, and which newspapers are less trusty, trustworthy. And there's an entire section of newspapers that deals with, um, what, what is the word? Gossip. Do you guys, you guys know that genre? You guys are kind of young, man. I don't even know if you know. Yeah, TMZ is a good one, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Tabloids. Right, so if you guys, this, this was more of a thing like when you go to the grocery store, they have a tabloid section. So the tabloid section is like who's dating who, uh, you know, so-and-so, her belly looked a little big, so she's pregnant, and she's, she was seen with this guy. You know what I mean? And it's just pure conjecture. It's just pure conjecture. Can I use those as reliable sources at all? No. Just like we have a grading system for things that we deal with nowadays, it's, it's not very different to how we grade some of the things in the past. And how do we do that? If I ask you guys, like, okay, what do you think about the New York Times? Most of you would be like, well, most of the information is, is trustworthy, right? Or the Washington Post, or like some of the major news outlets. And there might be some of us who'd be like, no, you know, I, I don't really, they're, they're far too skewed and far too biased. And some of you might go to more right-leaning politically, right? Some of you might trust Fox News more, or Blaze TV, or like uh, OAN. And some of you might be very vocal about it. And, but, <laughs> 
But it, at the end of the day, these are all different news sources of how people take them. And you have people who are a little bit right of center. You have people who are a little bit more left of center. Uh, and, and it's just important for us to understand how we deal with this information, understanding the biases behind them so that we can learn to actually take away that concrete piece of news, which in this case is what the Prophet ﷺ said, what he did, or his, the tacit approvals that happened in front of him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the connected chain. How does this play a role in the news? Do we have, the, the, does this chain system like exist today? <coughs> yes, no? Yes. Okay, yes, where, and nowhere. So I, I think yes it does, but how? What yes? One second, huh? Sure, but that's in research, right? But research is very different than me bringing a piece of information or news. All right, that's more uh, exploration and investigation. You were going to say something? Yeah, digital platform. So in digital platforms, how it works. So like when the New York Times reports something or the Washington Post, when, do they, when they report something, is it possible that all of them have reporters stationed in all of these places that news is going on? No. no. But you have a larger organization, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with. What is it called? that actually encompasses all of them. I, I promise I'm not like a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> I mean, maybe a little. Have you, you guys ever heard of the AP, the Associated Press? Yes. What is the Associated Press? Mm -hmm. Man, you guys need to step up your news game. <laughs> huh? It's, it's not necessarily freelancer. So basically what it is, it's like a conglomerate and a collection of a different, all different news agencies. And what happens is when you guys read an article, many times they'll say that this is taken from, that you'll see in parentheses AP, right? The Associated Press. And this allows them to have a larger net when they report things because they don't need to have, is it possible that a news agency has reporters everywhere? No, it's impossible, right? It's not, it's not realistic. Like, logistically, it's just not possible. It's, it's gonna, it would cost way too much money. So what happens is, is that they actually have what's the Associated Press, which is a lar larger group of uh, associations from these different news agencies that kind of allow them to interuse this news. So when I look at a news article, if I don't see a name and I see Associated Press, this is almost like a chain, right? So where did they get their news from? They got it from the Associated Press. Is the Associated Press a trusted news source? And you can actually subscribe to the Associated Press, by the way. Like, so if, if you want to bypass a lot of like, the secondary sources, you can actually subscribe to them uh, directly. So the chain does exist today. It's just not in the same form. Because the Associated Press, is it an individual? No, right? It's like, it's like a group of different people. Sometimes you don't even know who the article is being taken from, because it's just taken from them at large. Uh, and you also have people like who are there directly. So sometimes you have people who are working for the Seattle Times, who are there on the ground and they're reporting, and that's important too. But that's close. That's not narrating. That's closer to what we had spoken about this before. Witnessing. Ah, oh, good. Uh, so the connected chain that every narrator makes clear who he is narrating from, utilizing the tools of narration, indicating precision. Any questions on this? Uh, there's some things I want to focus on. He makes clear who he's narrating from, utilizing the tools of narration, and this gives us an indication that this is a precise chain. So here, he makes clear who he is narrating from. Like what? What is a way that I can make clear who I'm narrating from? Their name. Using their name, right? So is it enough for me to say, for example, Abdullah? Abdullah told me. Why? Too many Abdullahs. Right, there are too many Abdullahs. So, at the, what should, can I do? Is it, but do I need to take like four generations of his grandparents? No. no, right, that's not necessary either. I have to give enough information so that when somebody asks me, they're able to identify who it is. But if I just say Abdullah, can you trust what I'm saying? No. No. Why? What you doing? Because you which Abdullah? All right. Say, yeah. Like, uh huh. Neighbor, yeah. Then it's like, okay, I don't know Abdullah, but I know that it's, I know even. Like Samta. All right. So you have to go far back enough so that the audience knows who the person Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it is important for me to, to give context to who this individual is. There's no doubt about that. 
And if I don't give enough information, it doesn't give me enough context, and we ha now have a narrator that is known to be majhul. He's unknown. And we had spoken about this before. If there's somebody, like for example, if there's Ahmed outside, do I know him to be a liar? No, but do I know him to be truthful? No, I, ju I just don't know anything about him. And it is at that point that I cannot make a ruling on the piece of information. Because I, I don't know. It's not that I don't trust him, I just don't know him. I don't have enough information about him to actually come to a ruling. And there are two things that can happen. Either I can reject the narration or I have something that's called tawakkuf. It's where I have to, I, I don't take a stance on that issue until I have more information. So what's the goal? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. The tools of narration. What are the tools of narration? So if I said to you guys, um, Abu Huraira said. Is that okay? It is, and it isn't. Why is it okay, and why isn't it okay? Uh, because I'm known to be upright, Allah Akbar. No, it's not okay. I'm sorry. Uh, uh. Okay, so, no, but I'm saying, Far Farhan is saying, Abu Huraira said. Hmm. Between? I, I, I'm not. Uh, all right. Mm -hmm. Said whatever statement it is. So if I said to you, Abu Huraira said that pizza is amazing. Huh? All right. So now you, you want to. Okay. So there's there's a few red flags that go off, right? What, what are some of the red flags? <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't say I didn't say radiallahu an. So there's a chance now that this person is not. Not, not the Abu Huraira, not the companion. Mm -hmm. If we assume, if we assume about him that he was or it was the companion, then what is another problem? Pizza. There is no pizza during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? P pizza wasn't a thing. Oh, I mean, like six, when, when was pizza? Yeah, you can look it up. I mean, they might have had manaish, you know what I mean? Like, but <laughs> so. You, 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 there are a few red flags that you guys became aware of immediately just by hearing it. But if I said to you, you know, for example, Abu Huraira, he is the one that narrated the hadith about... Um, that's a good example. All right, let me give you an easier example. Omar radiallahu anh, he narrates that actions are based on their attention. Huh? 18th century? Oh man, so it's like 1200 years after the Prophet 18th century, really? That's when they pizza? called it pizza. Oh, that's when they called it pizza? <laughs> okay, before that, what was it? Manaish. It was Manaish? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's I might have to check up on that narration. So, <laughs> so over here, what we have is, you know, Umar radiallahu he said that actions are based on their intentions. Mm -hmm. Right, and this is a well-known hadith. So over here, in this situation, is it okay for me to say that now? That Umar radiallahu anh said, because now we had said that I made clear who I'm narrating from and utilizing the tools of narration or utilizing the words of narration. There's different ways that scholars narrate. And what are some of those tools and what are some of those ways? What I did now, now is it, is it possible that I met Omar radiallahu anh? No, I mean I'm old, I'm not that old, right? So it's not, it's not possible that I have met Omar radiallahu anh. It's impossible. So here immediately, what happened to the chain? It's not connected, right? There's, there's a break there. But you also have to look at what, what am I doing? When I'm saying that Umar radiallahu anh said, am I narrating? Right, that's, 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 a, that's also a valid question. Am, at this point, am I narrating? No. no, I'm not. Why? Because the era of narration is? Is it still active? Are we still narrating? No. No, the era of narration is done. It's finished. Sure, there's, the era of narration is over. Those are all ijazat. Ijazat is a little, it's a little bit different. It's a little bit different and, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that inshallah. But once the hadith were mudawan, once they were recorded, that's it. The Arab narration ended. So for me to say now, Umar radiallahu anh said, and this is something that's very natural, right? It's something that's very natural. So even in the first few generations, many times they didn't mention this not. They wouldn't mention the chain of narration because every time when we speak, do we mention all the two or three people who are in the middle who we might have heard a piece of information from? No, it's, it's not a done thing. It's not a natural thing. So for the scholars to even come up with this Isnad system, this was a, a genius move on their part. Because they're like, okay, we need to figure out a way to actually attribute these things back to the Prophet Muhammad 
And we, we need to have something that we can rely upon to actually trust this piece of information that's received, that, that we're receiving and that is coming to us. So what are the tools of narration? The tools of narration, you have a few. An is one, Hadathana is another, Akhbarana is another. All of these are different ways that I heard or I was sitting in the gathering and it was read to me or I read to the Shaykh or this is on his authority. So these are the different tools of narration that the scholars actually used. And with those tools, it helps us understand whether he sat with that sheikh, whether that sheikh read to him, or whether he read to the sheikh. And these are something that is really, really important. Or something that maybe he didn't hear directly from him. And there are different ways to actually express this. Um, so knowing this individual narrators, it's important to know that. Why? Because we have to trust that they're the ones that relayed the statement from the beginning of the chain to the end to make sure that none of the narrators in that chain have been deleted or a narrator has not been added onto that chain. And we're going to talk about something important. So here, the last part, that if I'm unable to identify a narrator, and we had mentioned one reason why that's a problem. If I can't identify that narrator, what are some other problems that can occur? And how come it's under this section of connected chains? So if I said, Abdullah said, Ahmed ibn Khalid said. This Abdullah we don't know. What, is, what are some of the potential problems with this unknown narrator? Right, it's like, we don't trust Abdullah, right? We, not, not, that, not because he's not trustworthy, we just don't, we don't know. But what is another potential problem with this unknown narrator? Could he have heard from someone else? Can we trust him to actually narrate on the person who he's claiming to narrate from? No. Is it possible there's two or three or more people between him and the one who he's claiming to narrate from? Yeah. Right, all of these things are possible, and this is why the scholars have included in this section, when they talk about itsal, when they talk about this connected chain, if I'm unable to identify a narrator, then the possibilities open up for multiple things to happen. And there are some exceptional cases, inshallah, which we'll get to, but in general, the moment I have an unknown narrator, I treat it as a what in the chain? I, t I treat it as a break. I treat it as a break in the chain. And this is why you have many hadith that will either be ruled on with weakness or something that they'll say will stop. Because if I can't identify the narrator, there's no way for me to know what is happening in that section or what happened before. Uh, so this stage is very important in identifying actual individual narrators. Uh, and it allows us to apply the previous two conditions. How? So we had said that trustworthiness and precision were the true previous conditions. How does this allow us, or how does this condition of ittisal allow us to apply those two conditions? Because we, ah, we have to qualify every single person in that chain now. So do you see how one leads into the other? how all of these conditions are actually very logical steps on how I should research and how I should approach these different sections of proving a hadith is sound or not. So, uh, so this leads us to the ability of placing a ruling on the narrator himself. He can be trustworthy. He can be precise. He can be one or the other. He can also be neither. Right? These, are, these are all possibilities. Or he can be what? Uh, the one I forgot to put on here. He can be both. So a, tr a, a, a narrator can be any combination of these things in addition to being both of them. And a, and a uh, narrator who is adil, and a narrator who is labit is somebody who we would call thiqa or trustworthy. Uh, and this is why an unknown narrator has to be rejected because we just don't know about that person. We had mentioned that. And, and we said that it is equivalent to a break in the chain because of the number of possibilities that open up regarding that individual. So here are some narrations I want to share with you. Uh, Muhammad al Sirin, he said that they would not ask about the chain of narration, but when the great calamity struck, they would ask, name your men. We would look to Ahl Sunnah and take their hadith, and we would look to Ahl Bid'ah and refuse their hadith. This is actually mentioned in Imam Muslim's Muqaddimah. And he also said, same Muhammad ibn Sirin, he said, this knowledge is religion, so look to who you take your religion from. These first two narrations, Muhammad ibn Sirin, he died 110. 
over here, the fitna, the great calamity. What is he talking about? The mihna happened after this. Because Imam Ahmadi died 241. What great calamity? What would happen this early, right? He died 110. Khawarij? Ahsant. Not just the Khawarij, who else? The Khawarij in the opposite with who? Their opponents. The Shia, right? The Shia, the Qadiris, the Jahmis. You had a rise of all of these groups. All of them began and all of them rose when? Khawarij is extremists, terrorists, people who throw other people outside of Islam because of sins. Hmm. What is a great thing? What happened? How did the, where did those groups rise? During which era? Even before. Yeah, this is, this is, you know the last companion hasn't died yet? Who's the last companion to die? You guys know? Amr ibn Tufayl, he was the last one to die. He died 120, I believe. So you still have companions, not either late companions or some of the Bedouin companions, who are still allow, uh, uh, they're still alive during this time. What era is he talking about? What is this great calamity? Yes. The death of the Prophet. They didn't start asking for us not that early, but they, it, it wasn't. Not just was it a calamity, it was the greatest calamity that ever struck the Ummah, was his death, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's no doubt about that. But what is he talking, because he's talking about the calamity that struck that relate, directly related to asking about Isnat. And you guys, and he mentions it clearly here, right? He's talking about Ahl Sunnah and Ahl Bid'ah. So clearly there's some kind of relationship there. When did these groups rise? When did they start becoming a problem? Yes? Was it contact with the, uh, like, you all for different regions? And, uh... I don't really like that one, man. It's like, it's like, you know, we, we, we ajam, we come in adulterated Islam. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not with that, man. I think, uh, I think the Arab did their own damage. <laughs> we, we didn't, we didn't add to the pot. <laughs> but that, that is a narrative. I just thought, I don't, I'm not, I'm not with that, man, at all. I, I think humans are always going to be humans regardless of where they're from. Saying that, the, the first group of scholars to rise, um, were, a lot of them were Farsi. Uh, hmm. You guys still tell me what calamities happened between, in this time period? So let's, let's assume he had like a, a regular life. I don't know when he was born, but let's assume that he died at 70, meaning that he was born when? Math majors. <laughs> he was born like around 40, right? So if he was born 40 Hijri, what, did he, what are some of the things that he saw and he experienced? All right, he's, the, well, the, the, that was at the end, right? So this is, he experienced initially the, the Khilafah of Muawiyah, right? He experienced the Khilafah of Muawiyah, um, and it was at the tail end of the death of Ali radiallahu anh, and his, and Hassan's taking of the Khilafah. So this calamity that, that he struck, that he feels was struck, what, what was that? Do you think it was the rise of Banu Umayyah? It could be, for sure. Because what happened during the Khilafah of Banu Umayyah? All, the, the great calamity, in actuality, was the death, like honestly, the, the death of Uthman, radiallahu anh. It was at that point, which groups started coming into power? You had the Khawarij, they had taken hold, they had caused fitna, and they had split the people. Even the civil war, who was the one who was inciting this war? The Khawarij were inciting it, and the Shia were inciting it. And every time, the problem with Ahl Bidah, and we had spoken about this before when it came to trustworthiness, why is it an issue? Why is it important to me, for me to know where this person stands theologically? The same reason we need to know why the per who owns the news corporation. Why? Because of bias. Because the bias that exists and the bias that's there. And it's something that needs to be and it must be recognized. Because if I understand that bias, it'll help me understand on how to deal with those particular narrations. Uh, Imam Zuhri, he said that put chains to your narrations. You narrate to us statements without bits and reins. You guys know what a bit is? A bit and a rein? What is he talking about here? It's, he's talking about horses. So a bit is the piece that the horse actually bites down on, right? Where you, you put it in their mouth, and the rein is what connects it. If I don't have that on a horse, what's going to happen? 
It's going to be astray, right? It'll, it'll just go wherever it wants. And that's exactly what he's saying here. He said, if I can't tie this down, if I can't tie this down, there's no way for me to determine where I am, I am going or where this horse has, has been. Uh, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, again, a, a, another great scholar, he said, the chain of narration for me is from the religion. Had it not been for the chain of narration, anyone could claim anything. So when it is said, who narrated to you, the religion is preserved. Again, all of these scholars showing the importance of the hadith culture and why we need a sanad, why we need an isnat. Um, I don't even know what I was trying to say. <laughs> I mean, my, my vocabulary is good. It's not that good. Man. Yes, jazakallah khair. It's indic indicative. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, because I'm, I'm just like, man, what am I trying to say here? So, um, and the, the term, the term senad itself, the term senad itself, it actually indicates to us and tells us what the purpose is behind it. The word senad in Arabic actually means that which is relied upon, something that you lean on. So the thing that I lean on, I want it to be what? Strong. I want it to be strong. And it's the same way with the isnad. Uh, linguistically, that which is relied upon, this is my sanad, yani what I rely on. Uh, it's an important logical piece of testing the authenticity of a piece of information, keeping in mind the authentic authentication process of seeking a lie or a mistake. Even in a, re a receipt in Arabic, it's also called a, it's also called a sanad. Why? Because it's something I can prove so that I made a particular purchase. I'm sorry? Yeah, that's actually. Yeah, no, like fatura is a very common use, but uh, it, it, which isn't wrong. Um, but sanad is a, is a better, uh, I would say, description for what it is. Yeah, I mean, like sanad for security. Like all, all of these purposes are definitely there. Right? This, this is what, because we're, we're relying on what? We're actually relying on our religion. It's through these chains on what we rely our religion on. Like the, the second biggest source that we have in Islam comes from these Asanid. And not just that, you know what else uses Asanid very famously in our, in our tradition? Qira'at. What is a Qira'ah? Well, the right? The, the, the readings of the Quran. The readings of the Quran, a lot of them rely on these Asanid. And these are the things that are still carried on until today. Now, as for what you're talking about, these, these are called ijazas. And ijaza is more of a, it's, it's more of a, I, I don't want to say cultural, but it's more of a, a connection to the Prophet ﷺ, and it's more of a witnessing to the authenticity of, of that book versus a narration of that book per se. So if I have an ijaza to Imam Muslim, this means that this book has been passed down from these people and a person either read the entirety of it or a section of it and, and that person is witnessing this book more than he is testifying to it. Because these people in the chains, even if you look at a lot of their tarajim. <laughs> but I, was, I, was like, I, was, I was like, it's not October yet. So, like, <laughs> so, uh, so what happens is that the, these chains, even if you have like a strong or a weak chain, it doesn't matter how strong the ijazah is. So because it's, 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 it's because it's not it's, it, does it prove that the book exists? Like for example, if you have like all these people who have ijazat in Muslim or in Bukhari or in uh, different riwayat or in different books, it's it's great. You know, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think it's something that's good. But saying that this ijaza, what is it telling of? Does it actually say th is this a proof that the book exists? Think about that. Not necessarily. Is it an additional proof that it's a real book and that this person actually authored it? For sure, for sure. But that's not something I would rely on to say like, oh, this book is real because of all these ijazat that are there. So ijazat, it's, like, it's actually considered the weakest way of, of carrying a hadith. They used to have ijazat you know, very early on in the hadith culture. And it's when they would actually give their books to uh, the scholar of hadith in order for him to narrate from it. Uh, the next one is Adma Illa, which is the lack of hidden defects. Inshallah, we'll talk about this next time, uh, and I'll we'll, I'll take questions after the adhan, uh, and then Inshallah we'll come back after salah for the tazkiyah class.
What are some ways that I can prove it? The previous layers. Okay, what about them? Mm. Mass transmitted. That's a different. Something being mass transmitted is different. But uh, in these individual chains. How do I prove that they're connected? Yes? There's like other chains that are different. Okay, so that, that's definitely corroborating proof. Right, if I see if I see parallel chains with them, because what are the chances that somebody made up like this elaborate, you know, this elaborate scheme of trying to get all these chains? Right, I I, I definitely think that's a uh, I, I think it's more of a secondary proof though. What else? Yes. If the narrator knows the previous person in the chain, is more is less likely to. Sure. Be How do I establish that? Huh? It's hold on. I want you to think about. Huh? Okay, that they met. Sure. How do I establish that? <laughs> hmm. How do I determine these things? What are some of the tools that I need? We take pride in the connected chain, but can we prove the connected chain? Huh? This, uh, yeah, it is. It is the senate, but how do I prove it? Cosman, one. Yeah, put you guys all in check of your dean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? You have to like, rely on other people who did it before. It's a good cop-out answer. Are you talking about going to start the origin? Yeah. I'm just asking, Yaki. So if I have a chain of narration like in front of me, how do I know that all these people met? How do I know that all these people heard from each other? Yes, you're going to say something, Nabi? I was just going to ask if your question was how do I know that two people met? Yes, sure. I'm sorry? You can ask their friends? Okay. Or people in their community? If people in their community? Yes. For sure. Well, now we can't, right? Because everybody's dead. <laughs> so I think it might be a bit challenging. Oh, you mean now? How do you Yeah, yeah. How do I do... Like, how do I establish that these narrators even met? Or that they heard from each other? Yes. The first two points. Okay. So this helps me now determine that they're not lying and they're not mistaken. For sure. Right? Or, or lessens the probability of a mistake. So the fact that he's truthful, what does that help me with? What else do I need to look at? Because now we're getting into more primary reasons. What is one of the things that we had talked about very initially? That the way people transmit tells us what? If I say hadathana akhbarana, what does that tell what does that tell me as the reader? How it was received. This person is directly telling me either I was sitting in this gathering and I heard the Sheikh reading to me, or I what? Or I read on the sheikh himself. This is something that allows me to trust that person. Other supporting evidence is that I can actually go through and read the biographies of many of these people that this person is a student of this person. And if I see from the list of his students that this person is not mentioned, does that now put me in doubt on whether he heard from him or not? Yeah. Yes, it does. Or that this is his sheikh, right? So in all of the books of Tarajim, right? In all of the books that talk about these biographies, you will actually have the narrator, his entire name, his kunya, right? His nickname, where he lived, when he died, and then you'll have a list of what? What else, what other information do you think is important? Yes? How righteous they were. All right, that's definitely part of it. That's definitely part of it, huh? Well, all of these things, right? So you're talking about his righteousness, his precision, maybe examples of that. But what else? What other information do I need? Right, who he's associated with when he was born. Like when he was born is usually not as important as when he died. But that sometimes that's mentioned too. His teachers. So you'll have a list of his teachers. You'll have a list of his, who else? His students and the people who heard from him. You'll have sometimes also example narrations. They'll say, and these are some of the hadith that this individual narrated. And that will give us confidence in who he is, who he heard from, and an example of some of the narrations that he actually has. So these are all different tools to help us establish on whether this person heard from him or not. But if I don't see, if he's narrating from a sheikh, I don't see from those lists of mashayikh, does that mean that he didn't narrate from them? Or from him? No. Not necessarily, right? Because those are mentioned as his, maybe his most famous teachers. Or the, or the people who he most famously narrated on. But it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it's not possible that he narrated on other than them. Or he had students other than the ones that were listed. It just gives us more confidence when we see both of those things there. So these are all ways to establish 
whether he heard from them or not. And again, the most important thing is the tools on how a hadith is narrated to us. And if we understand that he either heard it in a majlis or he read it on the shaykh, this helps us understand that these the, the, they actually heard. And he actually sat and he actually listened. And in addition to that, what it, we had talked about knowing that when he died. Why is that important? Right, because if, if you say, okay, there, as long as there's a chance that the shaykh and a student, yarhamukullah, as long as there's a, the chance that there's a shaykh and a student, that they lived in the same time period, that gives me trust that I can. Right? It's like, okay, as long as there's a chance that they've met, then now I can give it, I can actually take this hadith with more, yeah, it's not impossible that they met, so that'll give more strength to how I grade and how I deal with that hadith. Ex exactly, exactly. Any other questions? So if yeah. Yeah. Like someone watched that on like IGTV or something like that. Mm -hmm. Does that make like there's no way to verify that this was done online? Like, the, yeah. the concept versus Iman. So the yeah. So so, so like, how? You know, so they even would have uh, they have these books called al uh, imali and basically what would happen is at the end when they finish reading the book they would actually start listing the students who sat and who who listened but it's, it's it's really it's amazing like how pre how precise a lot of these things were where they would be like okay you know and we finished reading this book on the sheikh on this day and fulan and fulan and fulan and fulan and fulan and fulan they were all present in the gathering and so and so was present but he was sleeping no, no, like to, I'm telling you, like to that extent, to that extent. Um, yeah, right. Then, then, because when you hear it from this narrator now, you'd be like, okay, yeah, this guy was he was asleep at the majlis, man. Like, or is it possible he just slept at that majlis, or is that something that he, you know, constantly did? Again, this is just the more information you have, the easier it is. As for what you're saying, you could, this would be more qualified. Be like, I heard it from him in class, and the person be like, I heard it on him through through IG. Now, would, would that take away from the weight of either? Um, I think maybe hearing it on social media because the, sometimes the voice isn't as clear, right? You know what I mean? Like, there are a lot of other things. The conversation that I have with you guys during class, sometimes that doesn't get through, right? It, it, like, versus me just speaking. So all of these things would be taken into account. Again, in whatever constraints there were at that time, those were taken into account. And the constraints that we have today, those would be taken into account when we, when we deal with this witnessing, when we deal with narration. Make sense? Alright, Zakmakh. Subhanakum, Hamdi Kushan Sutra to Bede. See you guys after Salah inshallah.